Okay. Good morning, everybody. Yeah. So um, I will talk about the uh, importance of vegetables in drylands, but my presentation is a bit more general. Um, Gulf will then specifically talk about, about um, gender issues and, and drylands. So, so the World Vegetable Center, we used to be known as AVRDC. We changed our name to World Vegetable Center or World Veg in short. So we are, we are an old organization worldwide. Our mandate is vegetables since 1970. Uh, we are a non-profit public good research organization. And um, we are present all over the world. And we have four regional offices in, in, in Thailand, in India, in, uh, sorry, five. Two in West Africa, Mali and Benin, and one in East Africa, here in Arusha. So, um, so we, we split our vegetables into two types. On the one hand, we have the global vegetables. Um, so these are the vegetables that you all know, the, the tomatoes, the onions, the beans, the cabbages, the cucumbers. But we, in, in essence, these vegetables are nothing else but water standing up. There's not much nutrition in them. And on the other, one, on the other side, you have the, the tra traditional vegetables. So this is a big focus for regional office in Arusha. And these vegetables in general, as you know, are much more nutritious, uh, much more sturdy against biotic and abiotic. I've got nothing here. Against biotic, against biotic and abiotic stresses. Um, they're much easier and faster to grow. And there is, uh, if, you, if you had a chance to walk around in Arusha, in the markets, you know, in Bergo, there's a growing demand for these vegetables in, in, in East Africa specifically. Um, yeah, we call vegetables a win situation, and win standing for women, income, and nutrition, specifically the traditional vegetables. So Ralph will talk a lot about the gender issue of traditional African vegetables. Suffice for me to say that women really are the custodians of, of traditional vegetable value chains in, in East Africa, and also the ones that decide um, how and which vegetables to cook at night for the families. As to income, I'm just showing you this, this graph, which um, shows you a couple of uh, vegetables compared to maize on the, on the right side. Let me just see if this one works. Yes? So look at the red bars. The red bar shows you gross profit margin per unit area. And there's three messages here. So message one is if you, hello? Yeah. If you grow vegetables compared to maize, there, there really is no comparison in terms of how much income you can make per unit area. Compare maize versus the vegetables. And the second message is comparing traditional vegetables, these three are traditional vegetables, to tomato, traditional vegetables are um, as good in generating income um, as tomatoes, sometimes even better. And this other bar shows you the cost factors. And this is the third message. Growing tomato is very, very costly with input of, of fungicides, um, herbicides, insecticides, but compare it with amaranth. There's very little cost you have to include to grow amaranth. So amaranth is really a, a, a high income generating, low cost vegetable compared to the rest. And then the third part of the win equation is nutrition. Yeah? And, and this, this, when we show this slide to people who do not know much about vegetables, they're always extremely uh, shocked uh, in, in a positive way. So this graph shows you how much 100 grams of a select uh, number of commodities give in terms of daily needs to a pregnant woman in the first semester. Yeah? And you can see that the staples, rice, cassava, millet, as examples, that there is no nutrition in there. Meat, of course, very important for proteins. These are examples of global vegetables, cabbage, tomato. There is no nutrition in there, or little. Yeah? Um, the, 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 the legumes, mung bean, vegetable soybean, uh, are very uh, nutritious, and they also have a lot of proteins. But look at the traditional African vegetables, and amaranth is also in there. Um, they are 10 to 100 times more nutritious than um, other vegetables and other commodities. And this graph does not show you all the secondary plant metabolites that these traditional vegetables have, the antioxidants, um, etc., that, that makes the FAO recommend that everybody in the world eats 400 grams of vegetables and fruits. Good. Now, back to World Veg. 
we have um, we have the biggest collection of, of vegetable germplasm in the world, public collection of vegetable germplasm in the world, in our headquarters in Taiwan. Um, we have about 60,000 accessions. Um, and what's more important is probably the diversity. We have 440 species from, from 151 countries. Um, in Arusha, we have uh, the biggest collection of traditional vegetables in Africa. It's about 3,000 accessions, of which 2,000 are traditional African vegetables. For those that come to World Veg on Friday, after, no, Friday morning, you will see that gene bank. Um, and this shows you, the bar shows you the distribution of traditional vegetables in our gene bank. Um, we have a lot of African eggplant, okra, roselle, amaranth, and then a whole bunch of other traditional vegetables. Now, these gene banks, and, and ECHO also has a, has a very nice uh, gene bank, they, they, they cost money. They, these vegetables do not magically appear in a gene bank. So, um, seed quality for what goes in a gene bank is very, very important. Physical seed quality. When we harvest seed or for, for vegetables that go into our gene bank, we, we want to make sure, for example, there are no weeds in those seeds. Physi physiological quality, viability and vigor, very important um, to make sure that the vegetables have at least 80, 90% germination rate and are very vigorous. And genetic quality. You don't want to mix um, or crossbreed new lines when you put in your gene bank, you want to have pure lines. So for example, for brassicas, they are cross-pollinating, so we have to use cages to separate the lines we put in our gene bank. Harvesting is also very important. Brassicas, we have to harvest dry. This is just examples. Huh? African eggplant, the stage of harvest is very important. It has to be a red stage at full maturity. Seed extraction manually or with machines, and then drying. Drying for seeds in a gene bank, um, and Echo also knows this, is, is very important. Your, your moisture has to be um, much less than 10%, which is difficult to achieve. So before they go in a seed storage, you basically measure moisture content, and then they go in a seed storage. So this, this is a lot of, of work and a lot of efforts. What I don't mention here is that all the seeds that is in a gene bank is characterized morphologically and also molecularly in many cases. So for those people that do want to order seed, um, we don't provide seed to individuals, but to research organizations and, and private and public sectors, just go to the website avrdc.org and click on seed. And it's avrdc.org without the www, by the way. So we are not a museum um, of, of, of seeds. So we, um, we, we, sep we, we, we distribute seeds worldwide, um, about almost 10,000 accessions every year. Since we are in existence, we have distributed almost half a million um, seed samples. And um, in, in East Africa, uh, a big chunk of our seeds goes to, of course, universities and national research organizations, but also a lot to seed companies. And I will now talk about three types of usages of how we uh, make seeds available to the, to the ultimately end user, the farmer. First, before I do that, um, I have one more slide of, of distribution of our traditional African vegetables from our gene bank in Arusha. And you can see that the biggest demand really is for cowpea, which is a vegetable that is highly drought resistant. Um, so the first use is, is the household garden. So Ralph will talk about this in great detail. I will not talk about it. But many gene banks are struggling of how to reach the end user directly. Um, and and, and this, the, the, the home garden seed kit, this is a seed kit, is, is a very unique way of how a gene bank directly reaches out to farmers and farmer groups. So basically, the seed kit contains anywhere between 5 to 15 different little seed packs. Um, and the whole seed kit is highly tailored to give, this is the basic uh, ID, to give a family of four nutrition year round. Um, and from a seed kit, you can produce 300 kilograms of vegetables in a year. Um, and um, yes, let me just leave it like that and let me have Golf talk more about seed kits. A second use is how we distribute um, and how we use our, 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 our germplasm for the public and the private sector, for varieties, new varieties. 
and there we work very differently. So this is a bit uh, the way how we breed um, and how we select vegetables and how we have been doing this for the last uh, 40 years. So we have our treasure here, the gene bank. Um, um, we focus a lot on traits, pre-breeding, yeah? specifically diseases, um, stress, tolerance, um, biotic, abiotic, and nutrition, something that many seed companies don't have the time or money or interest to do. But nutrition for us is very, very important. Um, and sometimes, um, I will talk about this in a bit, we go all the way down to actual breeding. I'm just going to try here. It's worse. Maybe it's your phone. Yeah, we go all the way down to actual breeding, um, and, and we have um, um, hybrid parents and hybrids. We also generate a lot of information on traits, um, on, on how to breed to private sector um, players, um, and a lot of capacity building training. We have had about um, 3,000 people trained over the years in Arusha, many of them on, on how to breed and how to select vegetables. Anyway, for each crop, we have a production profile. This is a production profile for amaranth. Um, we, we focus on dark green leaves. Um, there are some exceptions. In Uganda, they like purple. But in general, East Africa, dark green. Um, very early growth figure. This is for when you, um, when you, when you up uh, root amaranth um, as a production technique. Where, whereas if you do continuous harvesting of amaranth, um, we, we, we aim for a long harvesting period. We also, and this is interesting, we go for high leaf production and high seed production. So even um, if you have a very high leaf yield and you have very low seed production, it's not a good variety because the, 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 the private sector is not interested. They need also a lot of seeds to make these amaranth lines. We also like cr creamy white seed color for grain amaranth because the dark colors um, it contain all kinds of, uh, of compounds that are not very palatable. Lodging resistance and compact panicles for grain amaranth. So for the public sector, we have released a whole bunch of traditional vegetables. For amaranth, we have released um, Madeira 1, Madeira 2. Um, and the way we, we do this is basically doing multilocational trials, um, which is now replaced with DUS requests. Uh, we still do multilocational trials with farmers, it's very essential. Toski then certifies for release. We um, give breeder seed to Horti Tengero, which is the, 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 the national program that is uh, responsible for making basic foundation seed to ASA, and then ASA gives basic foundation seed to certified, so sorry, to private companies that make then certified seed. Good. Um, we have a whole bunch of amaranths in the pipeline for release. The DOS testing has been done, so we have a, a, a UG line. I will not mention the entire names, but we have a UG line of amaranth that, is, that, that, is, has, that has a very high leaf yield. We have a dual type amaranth um, HDL cell um, that, is, that is very good. And we have a very great um, crane amaranth called Paris with, with big white seeds. What we also are doing now is really going for, for, for breeding and, and selecting pure lines. We have F5 and F6 populations of amaranths, purple ones and green ones that have very, very high leaf yield and which we want to release very soon. Um, with the private sector, so this was a bit public breeding sector, now private breeding sector, we changed our tech recently because they come knocking on our door, they want all our um, breeding lines and then they disappear. Um, and that way it doesn't work. So we really started with, with an African uh, breeding consortium. So what we give to the, to, the, to the companies, we give germplasm, we give information on how to breed and what traits are present in our germplasm, and we give training. What they give to us, they are part of a consortium. So they pay us to be part of this consortium. They share information on the seed sales because this is information we need to convince our donors of the importance of having gene banks, um, and they also give us their breeding material. If they don't do this, they are not part of the consortium and they don't have access to our material. I just give an example. I don't know what time I still, how much have I talked now? Five minutes left, so I will not give this example. It's a very interesting example. Um, 
sorry, it's about bitter court. Um, last use of, of, um, of, of vegetables um, from our gene bank is for emergency situations. So there's a lot of emergency situations we have been working on. Um, flooding, tsunamis, earthquakes, drought, volcano eruptions, war, typhoons over the last 10 years. And these are the locations in the world where we have worked. So for drought, uh, particularly interesting for this conference, we worked a lot in Tanzania. And um, this graph shows you the distribution of our seed for emergency situation versus household situation. The top three vegetables are traditional African vegetables, but that's the only, that's the only similarity. If we go for distribution of seeds for emergency situations, we focus on kangkong, Chinese cabbage, and amaranth. So these top two here are vegetables that grow very quickly in, in areas that are completely wiped out by tsunamis, by um, volcanic eruptions, by flooding. Amaranth um, is also um, uh, good vegetables for that. Now, within a vegetable, we also focus on very different accessions or varieties. So again, emergencies versus household. In emergency situations, we focus virtually only on this particular amaranth line, HTL. Why? Because this is an amaranth variety that grows very, very, very quickly um, compared to the other lines we have in our, in, our, in our gene bank. And this shows you, as a function of the emergency, the seed distribution, uh, the types of seeds we give out for each emergency. So I'm going a bit quick now, but this is drought. Yeah, for example, and this is um, a volcanic eruption. So the, each color represents a different variety of vegetable. So you can see that the vegetable profile is completely different for these two. For drought, the two vegetables that we always focus on for emergency situations is vegetable cowpea uh, and vegetable soybean, because these guys are really resistant for drought situations in marginal areas, including in Tanzania. So with this, I end my presentation, and I hand the microphone to um, Ralph, who will talk about um, home gardens and gender relations in dry areas. Thank you very much, uh, Thomas. Um, somebody has to help me to, oh, I think Aaron is already putting my presentation up. Yeah. Thank you very much. So uh, I'm going to talk about uh, household gardens, nutrition and gender in the context of dry areas. Yeah. Um, why do we talk about nutrition? Well, it's because malnutrition is such a huge problem in this part of the world. Um, we've got phenomena like stunting and anemia. Stunting is that you're uh, too short for your age. Particularly for very uh, young children, that is a problem because they don't recover from that. And to give you some figures, between 35 and 55 percent of young children, preschool children, suffer from stunting. Uh, similarly, for this, those, the same category of children, between 30 and 73 percent are anemic. They don't have enough iron in their blood. Now, why is that a problem? Stunting and other forms of undernutrition contribute to child mortality, disease, and disability. And it's irreversible in many cases. Well, mortality obviously is irreversible. Um, if we unpack that a little bit, um, disability, for instance, blindness, is due to, uh, among many other things, vitamin A deficiency. Um, and another problem is brain and neural defects, and that can happen because you don't eat enough folic acid in your diet. And it is also proven that uh, inadequate intake of iron, folic acid, and iodine affects the development of the brain and nervous systems and negatively affects school performance. You're talking about a whole generation, a future generation that will not reach their potential because of lack of micronutrients. As my colleague uh, Thomas uh, has already shown you, there's a huge difference in terms of the, the, global, the, the, the global vegetables like cabbage and the traditional vegetables that we focus much more on. Um, 
The, those traditional vegetables, I'm giving two examples here, amaranth and uh, African nightshade, they have way more iron, zinc, calcium and, vit vit and um, vitamin A. Um, in this case, uh, ranging between one and a half to 14 times more per 100 grams dry matter. So huge, huge, huge differences just by selecting the right type of vegetable. Um, so what do we do about it? We have um, um, a project called Home Garden Scaling, um, it was funded by USAID, um, in which the primary outcome of our objective was to improve the nutritional status of women of childbearing age and small children. Um, we use a theory of change because that depicts, that shows you where you come from and where you have to go to. Where do we come from? Problems, underlying problems. That is the usual situation where, that we find in the field. Lots of problems that we have to deal with. We have to go to long-term impacts such as increased income, sustainable vegetables, seed supply, and imp leading to nutritional improved status. How do we get there? Through strategies. We use push and pull strategies. Push is about getting the seeds out there, getting that variety, diversity of seeds, nutritious vegetables that taste well, that grow well, that are disease resistant. We do that through seed kits and we make those seed kits also sustainable by involving the private sector so that they take it up and we cannot, we are a non-profit organization, we can um, distribute thousands of seed kits but not millions. When you talk about Eastern Southern Africa, millions of seed kits need to be um, getting, uh, distributed. We also have gender um, uh, strategies and now we're talking, we're getting more into the, into the pool. Why uh, is it important that you involve um, women? Because women are the custodians of nutrition. They have to prepare better food. Why is food uh, so important? Why is nutrition important? What, uh, many people in the villages do, do not understand malnutrition. It's often called the hidden hunger because you don't see it. Your children look healthy, but they are stunted and anemic. So, nutrition awareness campaigns, that's what we call the pull, creating that demand. Then we have the push by the seed kits and capacity, capacity building, um, and, and, and not uh, unimportantly, capacity building about how to produce those vegetables. So, also we work with others, um, there are some uh, areas that we work hand in hand, like uh, Ministry of uh, Health, uh, WASH uh, practices, these all contribute to uh, better nutritional status. When we talk about nutrition and gender, we have to also, it's, un, in, in, it's inevitable that we look at the, the problems that, we, that I discussed in the previous slide, but problems is also a matter of resilience. We work with the poor segments of the population. We work in those areas where malnutrition is strife. These people are vulnerable. Vulnerable is the opposite of resilience. We want to create resilience. They are food insecure, so we want to create food security. They are malnourished, so we want to give them healthy diets. How do vegetable household gardens contribute to that? Well, in terms of the basis of the, basics of the pyramid, the resilience, we create, uh, it creates income. They, um, vegetables can be sold on the market, they, and those, uh, that income creates assets. Assets are important for resilience. Um, food, uh, vegetable households, um, um, uh, the vegetable household gardens also provide uh, uh, food security, of course, that food and the vegetables can be consumed and sold, and that for, from the money you can buy other uh, uh, ingredients such as uh, animal source proteins, and you consume, obviously, leading to healthy diets. Now, what is resilience? What is food security in healthy diets? Some the, the, the distinctions are a bit fuzzy. Can anybody get, shout out what is food resilience? Just something that comes up in your mind. Or what is resilience and what is food security? Anyway, it's still early, but let me just give you <laughs> a few definitions. Resilience 
is not is not a, 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 um, an unchangeable status. It's the ability to anticipate and adapt and to recover from um, um, uh, situations, the, the effects of shocks and, and stress. So not only to deal with the stress, also to anticipate and to, to come out in a better way after you've been uh, um, uh, attacked by stress, such as drought. Food security is, um, um, it is something that affects all people. Um, all people need to have access to sufficient and safe and nutritious foods. Yeah? So it's, 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 it's a subset of that resilience. If you are not resilient, food security is very difficult to achieve. Now healthy diets is even more specific because that is about meeting the nutrient requirements according to the indi individual physiological status, such as uh, pregnant or being very young or being very old, and health status. If you are uh, very sick, you also need different types of nutrients. Um, but it's also about moderation. Malnutrition can also be overnutrition. That's also a form of uh, malnutrition and it's increasingly uh, um, um, affecting uh, poor and uh, uh, populations and uh, people of the lower social classes. So moderate amounts of salt, sugar and fat are important. And then we have the issue of fiber is good for a digestive system and phytonutrients. Okay, so we know, um, we know the difference between the resilience, food security, and healthy diets, but how does gender affect that? Anybody wants to shout out what is the, re what is the relationship with gender and resilience? Sorry? It's direct. It's direct, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Any el elaboration on that? Right, yeah, yeah, so it's women, yeah, women, foods, they pre prepare the food, right. Resilience um, is about also about assets, yeah, resilience is about having access to land, resilience is also about being educated. Um, all these are positive things that contribute to resilience. If you don't have that, you fall more into, you, it's easier to fall into vulnerability. Now, asset education, access to land, these in the African context are very, very heavily gender, um, uh, gender tainted, if I can say that. Food security, obviously, um, women prepare food, um, Food security is also about traditions, um, about habits, about um, what, um, what is the place of women and children in the household, who eats first. Uh, for instance, in, in, in some tribes, in some parts of Kenya, um, women are, should not eat chicken. That brings bad luck. Yeah? Now, if you have a, a, a pregnant woman, if she doesn't have access to pro, uh, animal proteins, um, then you need to have a pretty good diet and eat lots of vegetables to compensate that. And healthy diets um, obviously is about um, uh, um, yeah, food preparation and having access of, uh, to resources, having um, income, yeah, you're being able to go to the market, also mobility. Yeah? Uh, men can go everywhere, but women cannot go in some uh, places uh, are, and are, uh, it's culturally not accepted if they move too far away from their homestead to exchange their food items, their agriculture products for other products, so to create and to provide a, a diverse diet. Vegetable production has a lot of constraints that, you, that we work on. Um, a whole range of constraints for household gardens and for commercial plots. If you look at these, you'll find that most of these constraints, again, are very uh, influenced by gender dynamics. For instance, no money for inputs. Men have op uh, often more access to money than, than women because they're highly more educated, have more access to jobs. 
um, or they have more access to markets. Uh, not enough water, um, women have to walk a long way, uh, sometimes three hours to get water, and, that w and women do carry water all the way for their home gardens. Um, not enough land, we've talked about that. Poor quality of land, as um, women often get uh, uh, less good plots to cultivate than men. The, the selection of the land is different. Garden too far from the homestead. So lot, all these areas, if, if you do an assessment of um, a rapid rural appraisal of the, 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 the challenges, you have to look at those challenges through a gender lens and design your strategies, both your push and your push strategies, through a gender lens. Talking now a little bit about uh, the challenges of water scarcity, um, it is important that you provide options to deal with water shortage and that these options are um, suitable for the type of people and the type of resources that those people have. We found that uh, sack gardens are a better way of using your water that you have to carry on your heads yeah, for three uh, hours or water that you have to buy from a picky picky who comes and you have to buy it for 100 shillings per tungi. Better to pour it in a sack because that sack contains the water more as opposed to pour that water on the ground and it just runs off in the ground or it runs to places where the roots of the vegetables cannot reach it. Here you use that um, uh, water in the uh, most efficient way. Another way that uses uh, water more efficiently is a keyhole garden. Keyhole garden is different layers of uh, uh, soil and uh, organic matter in a kind of um, pyramid uh, shape and in a round shape. And in the center, you have an organic pit. You pour the water in the center, it carries the nutrients and the water to the root areas of the uh, vegetables. Drip irrigation is often considered something technology, have heavy on technology, but it doesn't need to be. Here's an example from Uganda where you see it's pretty simple. Uh, a few buckets um, uh, suspended on a, uh, on, on, on a wooden frame um, linked to uh, a two different tees. Every tee has two lines, uh, drip lines of about 10 meters. And this has really changed the lives of this family completely. They are able now to produce uh, vegetables uh, for the market, obviously also for their own home consumption, but they are com they've turned into a commercial farmer. This investment, how much was this investment, do you think? $20, right? So be creative in the term type of technologies that you're thinking about. Um, I'm concluding with uh, uh, th three more stories from different parts of uh, East Africa. This is from uh, Kiteto district, very dry area in uh, Tanzania. And um, this lady, she's a grandmom, um, Manaida Saidi. Um, she has to buy water. In Kiteto, there are no rivers, there's no streams, there's no lakes. There are some pits, some commercial and some entrepreneur entrepreneurial youth. Uh, they dig big holes, really, really big holes, and get water. And uh, some uh, some motorbikes fetch that water, and some bicycles, and they and they sell it. And um, she uses five buckets in the morning and five buckets in the evening to water her garden. So we asked, is that really? Is that real? Does that make sense? You know, paying a thousand shillings every day to, for water for your gardens. And she said, yes, it does make sense, because she can now harvest that vegetables on a daily basis, and she can provide food to her family, to all her grandchildren. If she had to provide the same amount of, if she had to buy the same amount of vegetables from the market, it would cost cost her two thousand shillings. Yeah. So she, she is actually making home economic sense by buying this water. Um, another story, this is one is from uh, Uganda, Robina, um, also a grandmom. Grandmoms are, are great people. They have a lot of experience and they are very, very driven and they have, obviously, they take care of their children and grandchildren. Um, she, is also, she also runs a school and you see a, a, a picture 
picture of the school at the bottom. And she provides, and uh, these children, um, they stay there the, um, for the, a big part of the day. They also need to eat. So she, gr she used to grow vegetables in her garden to provide a school lunch. We provided her with seed kits, and she started then providing, growing different types of vegetables. One of them was nakati, a an improved uh, form of nakati. And she loves it. Children loves it. Very nutritious. And the, the, she has seen her children blossom. And also the parents have seen their children become more healthy. Nakati is a great, great um, vegetable, uh, leafy vegetable. Um, so actually through, her, uh, through that gardening, and she involves her children in the gardening, she feeds the children, she educates the children, the, the, the parents are being educated, she creates awareness about good nutrition, about uh, home gardens, and about improved varieties. So great story. This is a story from Kenya, um, Eileen. Um, she's, she is a farmer in Western Kenya. Um, she is uh, entrepreneurial. She kind of has that, uh, that um, ability to, uh, to lead others. And she stands out from the crowd, but also the ability and the, the desire to help others. So she um, has been uh, walking into the, the office of the local government with whom we also uh, collaborate. And when she learned about the home garden scaling project, she was chosen, uh, she was given an opportunity to lead others. We work with community-based trainers, so we trained her. Um, so she's training others now in a demonstration garden. But what she, the innovation that she created is that um, because we also, during our campaigns and awareness creation, we also educate on the improved ways of cooking vegetables. She has changed completely the way she cooks vegetables. Um, in that part of uh, uh, Kenya, they uh, traditionally cook, um, they harvest vegetables, put it in a pot and cook it, and then the next day cook it again, and then the next day cook it again until it's finished. So they harvest a lot and they cook, recook it ev the, the, the whole week. To make matters worse, they add water and pour away the water so that to remove the bitter taste. What you are eating on the fifth day, on the seventh day, is not really m much more than fibers. Okay, fibers are good, but you also need the nutrients, obviously. Um, we have introduced better ways of cooking. With, uh, leafy vegetables, you only need to fry it or uh, parboil par it for a couple of minutes, and then they are ready to eat. But you need to add a bit of onions, a bit of flavors, for lo using local ingredients. So she is now campaigning um, in, in, in her area to actually change cooking habits. Okay, the way forward. Um, when you want to improve nutrition uh, through home gardens, you need a, a push as well as a pull strategy. Push getting the technologies and the seeds out there. Pull to create demand and awareness about why is it so important to improve your nutrition. Gender analysis, is gender analysis is critical for addressing constraints in vulnerability, food security, and healthy diets. And to improve vegetable production in dry areas, consider innovations that are affordable, sustainable, on the long run. Thank you very much. Okay. That was spectacular. You guys are four minutes ahead of time. We're going to be on schedule. We need somebody to tell uh, folks outside that we're going to be ready for tea in like 15 minutes. <coughs> and uh, we'll be taking questions. We'll, I guess we'll follow the pattern from yesterday of asking five questions at a time and then having these uh, folks respond to them. So my first question I'm going to ask, which is uh, what temperature do you reach with the solar dryers with the uh, idea that if you get too hot, you may start to destroy nutrients. And so I'm just curious if you know what level the, that heat reaches, uh, particularly for drying vegetables in four or five hours. And now we're ready for the second question. I have the, you hear me? I have the mic. I didn't know what is that vegetable in the Ugandan garden you yeah, you have to tell me what that is. You didn't ask the question yesterday. 
Uh, I was wondering how, how much area have you reached in Tanzania? Just curious, because some of the places where we are would be potential to collaborate with you. In Mara region, we are working with uh, uh, 231 primary schools uh, doing school gardens, but again collaborating with uh, um, communities. Uh, I work on, 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 on um, uh, school gardens, also um, work, uh, producing other crops in those areas. And in my view, this could be an area that we could collaborate, but I wanted to know the reach in Tanzania, where exactly are you working and whether you think of expanding or whether we can discuss on how to collaborate. That one back there. You're picking questions, yeah? You pick them all? Thank you so very much. Personally, I'm considering having World Day Vegetable Center right in Tanzania, but in particular in Arusha, as an opportunity. Yesterday, we have been di discussing about the challenges we are facing, especially in seed for grain amaranth. Now the question comes, how can World Vegetable Center help in addressing the issue of seeds, especially for grain amaranth? Thank you. My question is, where, how can we get these uh, seed kits Uh, mine goes to the World Vegetable Center. You have uh, researched on a number of vegetables. Have you also gone an extra mile to, to know specific uh, diseases that attack these vegetables and how to control them? Thank you so much. I'll just bring you a microphone if you guys want to answer in place. Yeah, no, I have, we have written them now. Okay, thank you. So I, I, I will start with answering some of your questions about the temperature. <laughs> yeah, so, so most nutrients um, are, are destroyed above 60 degrees. But the, the way that these solar dryers work, Erwin, um, so the, the, the solar dryers you know, which are the direct solar dryers, they work through conduction. Sun shines and then over time it, it heats up. These indirect solar dryers work through convection. It's really blowing, it's like a chimney model. You suck in air and you blow it because hot air rises. You blow it through a chimney. So the airflow is very intense, very high with hot air, which is not more than 50 degrees. So that's the way they dry, the indirect solar dryers. Um, and, and the ones that, you, that I showed you are indirect solar dryers. And these are also the solar dryers we, we have with farmers and farmer groups in, in, in uh, Babati and Karatu. Um, yeah, seed for grain, Amarant, how can we help? Um, yeah, we, we depend on, on, on the public and the private sector. Um, we are not a seed company, um, and it ultimately demands, depends on, on, on the demand for farmers. Um, for open pollinated varieties, which Amarant is one, um, seed companies have always a problem because there's no IP on open pollinated varieties. So marketing of new varieties is for seed companies, I'm, I'm talking about the East-West, the Kibo seeds, the Alpha seeds, it's not something they want to invest in because they invest in marketing and then company B can simply take over the varieties without spending money on marketing and it's, and it's, and it's taken up. So it's very difficult to push or pull a new variety into the market um, but it's, it has happened a lot uh, with, with some of our varieties, but over time and slowly. But um, um, as I mentioned, um, so, so the tomato, Tengeru, uh, 97, Tanya, um, DB3, uh, for eggplant, these are all varieties coming from us um, that took 10 years to be pulled into the market. Um, it's really farmers that, that promote it among themselves and then the seed companies jump on it. For green amarant, um, we, 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 we are releasing very soon, as I mentioned, that variety, that um, um, UH something is, is the accession name, but of course the companies will put their own name on it. Um, and this is go going to Hockey Tengeru, um, that, that, that then um, gives certified seed for, for seed companies. 
Um, so yeah, we have a very good variety in the market soon. Um, how to get seed kits? Um, um, yeah, so one thing which is very, very important is, is we are not a seed kit factory. Um, so if people come to us and some organizations do that, big organizations, we want 10,000 seed kits. We say no because the, um, the seed kit is just the top of the iceberg. We know from experience that it has to come with full training of trainers and full capacity building um, um, of, of farmers and farmer groups of how to utilize these vegetables all the way from seed production to seedlings to, to, to pest diseases, marketing, cooking. Cooking is very important. Um, so it comes with, with a full package. Um, that's one thing. The second part of the seed kit, so the seed kit is really geared for smallholder farmers. They, they don't have money to buy one kilogram of amaranth to spread on several hectares. They want a home garden type of situation. So seed kits is very big business in India. So we work a lot in India. We steal a lot of our own ideas from India and translate them to Africa. Um, so in India, seed kit is a big business. Many companies make seed kits geared for smallholders. Um, and the, 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 in Africa, there is, there is no market for it because there is no knowledge about it. And what we are doing and what Ralph has been doing, he didn't talk about it, is, is pulling those seed kits into the market and making sure that the private sector makes those seed kits. Ultimately, the private sector has to make those seed kits and, and you need demand. You, so, so on the back of the envelope calculation for a, any private company to make seed kits, um, which is difficult to make. Eh? You, you have to tailor these seed kits uh, for, for specific regions. Uh, back of the envelope calculation requires about 50,000 seed kits a year per country before a private company will jump on this. Um, all right. Um, I've noted down a couple of uh, questions that uh, I hope I'll be able to answer. First one uh, was about uh, Nakati. Uh, so nakati is a leafy vegetable in Uganda. It's actually it's of uh, the same species as uh, African eggplant, so Lanum ethiopicum. Yeah, um, but and in in Tanzania we know this as ngogwe. Yeah, the white uh, the white eggplant. Yeah, it turns green, it turns yellow and a bit orange if you leave it too long on a plant. It's the same species as Nakati, but it looks completely different. Yeah? Ngogwe um, grows up to like one and a half meters. Um, Nakati is only 30 to 40 centimeters high, tiny leaves, very tiny fruits. So obviously, it's a different variety of the, of, uh, of the species. And um, it's, it's really only there in uh, New Ghana. And that's so interesting. We work in many different countries in the world and everywhere this, the, the, the taste, the preferences are completely different. Very important that you do a good uh, uh, rural appraisal uh, with women and men about uh, the, the preferences of uh, leafy vegetables and other vegetables. Um, the other question was about the, uh, uh, the areas in Tanzania that we have, where we have worked. Um, in this particular U.S. aid funded project, we worked in uh, two districts and one in Zanzibar Island, yeah, Unguja Island. The two districts were Babati and uh, Kiteto. And we have worked with approximately 12,000 different households in those three areas. Um, we have similar projects uh, on home gardens funded by others sometimes. Um, um, projects also have a commercial uh, arm on it, uh, like uh, home, home gardens for home consumption, um, veg commercial vegetable gardens for the markets. So there's all sorts of different um, uh, projects and, we, and, and those projects have also been implemented in Arusha, in um, uh, Kilimanjaro, in um, uh, Morogoro, and yeah, different parts, Iringa. Um, the last question that I've got here is about diseases. Um, have you experienced diseases in these vegetables and what did you do about it? Um, 
Yes and no. The good thing about traditional vegetables, they are much more resistant than the commercial uh, vegetables um, that, we, that you're used to, such as the tomatoes, the onions, the cabbages. Um, in the beginning, we also included some of these um, international vegetables in the seed kits. And the reason we didn't continue with putting them in the seed kits is because they had too many diseases and were just too problematic. Um, of course, you can spray chemicals, but because we work with, um, with um, uh, people that are often illiterate, uh, people um, in areas where you can't get chemicals, in areas where that um, um, advice on how to safely use chemicals is not there, it's just too much of a risk. So we decided only to go for an integrant, integrated pest management strategies using natural um, um, pesticides. So for instance, the pests that we do get on these vegetables are aphids, uh, spider mites, and there are methods of, of dealing with those. Uh, we teach, we have um, prepared, we've done some experiments and we've prepared training manuals on how to extract natural ingredients from neem trees, either from the leaves or from the seeds, uh, how to extract um, um, ing active ingredients from uh, tithonia, from lantana camara, from uh, preparing garlic and pili pili preparations that deal with aphids and with spider mites. Um, uh, this another disease that is common, particularly on okra and on the other on cucurbits, is um, powdery mildew. Again, you can uh, with uh, with cultural practices. Some, it's not only about applying pesticides; it's also about uh, practices, healthy plant practices, making sure that you there's enough. Spa the spacing is big enough so there's air circulation to prevent the fungal infections. But if you do see them, you, you, you can make uh, um, concoctions of uh, sodium bicarbonate in oil and spray on, on, on the early signs of, uh, uh, of powdery mildew. So we have a, a range of common uh, um, pests and diseases and, and natural and non-toxic, um, non non-human toxic uh, ways to deal with those. So, thank you to the speakers again.